This memorabilia was related to the Lindeborough trial, and it originally belonged to the guest's great-grandfather, David Miller Klein. Klein had taken care of the jailer for Hauptmann during the trial. Part of the collection was donated to the New Jersey State Police Museum in Trenton. Providing context about Charles Lindeborough, he became a national hero after completing the first solo transatlantic flight in 1927. But his fame turned into a national tragedy when his 20-month-old baby was kidnapped on March 1st, 1932. This was the crime of the century, and the baby was later found dead near the Lindeborough property. Among the memorabilia brought in by the guest were original signs and wanted posters from the trial, including law enforcement posters showing handwritten specimens linked to the kidnappers. Additionally, the collection included a first-day cover featuring an imprint of the infamous ladder that implicated Hortman, a carpenter, in the crime. Another notable item was a penny imprinted with courthouse markings from the trial. The guest also had a Lindborough-signed first-day cover and an original ticket needed to attend the trial. The appraiser estimated that the posters alone in their excellent condition. The posters in general in this condition at auction would bring between $2,000 and $3,000. The additional material, including the first day cover and the imprinted penny, were estimated at. And the extra material that you have just here would add another $1,000 to $1,500. Our guest's mother repaired these leathers after Evil Knievel's jump at Caesar's Palace in December 1967. Evil Knievel never picked up or paid for the repaired leathers, leaving them in the guest's possession. The appraiser highlighted tumble marks and damage from Knievel's crash, adding authenticity to the piece. Knievel, a motorcycle daredevil from Butt, Montana, became famous for his numerous jumps and stunts. Evil Knievel was born in Butte, Montana. And I actually knew Evil. He told me that when he was a kid, he knew he was going to do something great. And so he bought a pickup truck in Butte, Montana. The leathers show significant wear, including a blowout at the elbow, road rash, and a puncture on the back. There's lots of road rash there. There's an over patch here, which I believe there's a puncture on the back side of that. Knievel's career and wildlife made him a celebrity, often appearing on talk shows. And the leathers were previously offered $10,000 eight years ago but the appraiser now estimates their value at. That these leathers at auction would be forty to $60,000. Really? That's <laughs> kind of amazing. If confirmed to be from the Caesars Palace jump, their value could exceed $100,000 at auction. The guest's husband received a mysterious watercolor piece from his drawing professor, sparking curiosity about its origin. The professor had purchased it from Jimmy Ernst, son of renowned surrealist artist Max Ernst in Lincoln, Nebraska. For 30 years, the piece remained an enigma until the guest decided to uncover its secrets. Jimmy Ernst's life was marked by his complicated relationship with his father, who abandoned his family when Jimmy was young. Uh, yes, he is the son of Max Ernst, who is one of the most important surrealist painters internationally. Jimmy was born in Cologne, Germany, and actually grew up there until he was about 18. His father had abandoned the family, and he was raised primarily by his mother, who was an art historian. Ernst's unique style, characterized by intricate brushwork and bizarre imagery, emerged in the 1950s. The piece the guest owns, dated 1959, exemplifying this style, blending watercolor and gouache techniques. As decorative arts from the 1950s gained popularity, Jimmy Ernst's work was increasingly sought after, a testament to Ernst's growing reputation. The artwork was appraised at. The value would be $5,000. That's nice. The guest's dad bought the chair in 1957, or 1958, to rock babies. My dad bought the chair in probably 57, maybe 58, to rock babies. The appraiser loves mid-century modern furniture and admires this design. It was designed by Charles Ames, a great visionary, and made by Herman Miller. The chair's date stamp is November 21st, 1957, indicating its production. Early fiberglass chairs by Ames have unique features like a rope edge and different rubber pads. Its seafoam green color is rare and adds to its value. The monetary value of this 1957 Ames chair is... A monetary value on a 1957 Ames chair like this is about $600 to $900, and it's an auction estimate. Wow. But it could bring more because of the rare color. Oh, okay, you know? yeah. The 
guest inherited this painting from her grandparents. She believes it's a French watercolor, but is unsure of the artist or value. She's always admired the painting's frame more than the artwork itself. The appraiser identifies the painting as a gauche on paper by French artist Eugene Galien Lelou. The painting depicts a Parisian flower market during a winter scene. It is dated to the early 1900s, during the Belle Epoque era. Galien Lelou became a war artist for France in 1914, indicating this painting was created earlier. The guest admits to having doubts about the painting's authenticity. The appraiser confirms the painting is genuine. The painting is estimated to be worth. We would estimate it at ten dollars to $15,000. Really? That's right. Oh, yay! <laughs> Thank you! What a treasure! The guest inherited a table from her mother about 30 years ago. It was purchased from a junk store in the Columbus, Ohio area. The table is an inlaid cherry one drawwork table with intricate details like star inlay and fan inlay in the corner. The expert believes the table originated from Kentucky or Tennessee. The guest expects the table's value to be less than $50. The table shows signs of wear, which is due to its age. It was made around 1810 to 1815. The guest mentions her mother likely acquired the table for free from friends during the 1960s. The appraiser estimates the table's auction value at. It would be estimated in the $6,000 to $8,000 range. That, that's over 50. That's, we can't use it as a TV stand anymore though, probably, can we? <laughs> Counters with legendary artists often become treasured memories, capturing the essence of their creative spirit. The guests chance meeting with Beatrice Wood at the Garth Clark Gallery in Los Angeles before it closed down offers a rare glimpse into the life of a true icon. Garth Clark Gallery, Los Angeles. Wood, known as the Mama of Dada, was a central figure in the Dadaist movement, famous for her vibrant personality and artistic flair. Beatrice Wood, her witty charm, epitomized by her secret to longevity, chocolates and young men, captivated everyone she met. Wood's pottery, renowned for its nacreous iridescent glazes, continues to enchant collectors and art enthusiasts alike. She discovered ceramics and she studied under Gertrude Nader Natzler. But what she really became known for were these colorful, nacreous iridescent glazes. This guest's collection includes two exquisite pieces from the late 80s, each reflecting Wood's distinctive style and craftsmanship. The neoclassical vase and intricately designed bowl showcase Wood's masterful craftsmanship and artistic vision. Uh, it's actually really uh, neoclassical, it's a straight takeoff on a Roman vase, it has a great nacreous finish to it. Collectively, these works, loved for their artistic beauty and rich stories, are worth. So I think easily you're looking at about $3,500 to $5,000 worth wow. of Beatrice Wood's work. That's great, that's really good to hear. The guest brought in a painting depicting his brother-in-law, a Wyoming sheep rancher, created by Minerva Teichert in 1959. Painting of my brother-in-law, who was a sheep rancher in Wyoming. It was painted, I believe, from the date in 1959. Minerva Teichert was a well-known artist from the Salt Lake area, famous for her religious and rural scenes. She lived in Cokeville, Wyoming, where the painting was kept and was a prominent figure in her community. Teichert was born in 1888 and raised in Idaho with a strict Mormon upbringing. She studied art in Chicago and New York under notable artists like Robert Henry. Teichert is famous for her large-scale works, including murals in Mormon temples and Brigham Young. The painting was an oil-on-canvas work with its original frame adding to its value. Uh, she is one of the more famous Mormon artists actually today. She was sent to school, at first in Chicago, at the Art Institute of Chicago, where she studied under Vanderpoel. The painting's value was estimated at. I would estimate this work at auction with a very conservative estimate of $10,000 to $15,000. Oh. The guests brought a rare three-volume set of nature journals, including a historic issue signed by James Watson. It features the groundbreaking discovery of DNA's double helix structure by James Watson and Francis Crick. This seminal paper, published on April 25, 1953, revolutionized molecular biology and cemented Watson and Crick's legacy. The owner acquired the journal as part of a package deal for $10,000, but its value extends far beyond its initial cost. That's signed by Dr. James Watson and the discovery of the double helix. Exactly. And 
back in Britain when they did this, it was very, very controversial at first. Watson's simple yet distinctive signature adds significant value to the journal, making it a prized possession for any scientist or collector. So what we have here is really one of the most important scientific papers ever published. This is the journal issue, we would call it, from yes. that book point of view. A copy of Watson's book, The Double Helix. Signed by both Watson and Francis Crick, it is owned by the individual. These rare items were not only historically significant, but also highly valuable, making them being estimated at. I still think the journal issue of that would be in that same five to 7,000 auction estimate, oh. maybe six to 8,000. I mean, it's fantastic. For insurance, you're looking at at least a $20,000 value to insure the right. both of them. 10 years ago, her aunt Julie gave them to her. Superman number no. seven from November to December, 1940 is a significant early issue in the series. Action Comics number no. 31, December 1940, features Superman's early adventures. The Action Comics series, the birthplace of Superman, shaped his defining elements and mythos. Discover the secret to comic book value. If you notice this little line down here, that's a dust shadow, which indicates that another comic book at one time was sitting on top of that a little bit crookedly and made that line. Both comics, originally priced at 10 cents, are key pieces of comic book history. They showcase Superman's early development and the golden age of comic books. Minor issues include small spine splits, chipping, and a dust shadow from uneven stacking. The appraiser valued Superman 7 and Action 31 for their crucial role in defining Superman's legacy. I'd be conservative and maybe put this at 5,000 to 8,000. So you're looking at roughly about $7,500 to $12,000 for an auction estimate. Famous sculptor Alexander Calder gave the guest this sculpture for his 15th birthday, which the guest suspected was being made during his visit. During the stay, the guest had the opportunity to explore Calder's studio, and despite Calder's Parkinson's disease, the guest observed him working with steady hands. Calder was known for his innovative mobiles, kinetic sculptures powered by motors or air currents, his static stabiles and his moment public sculptures. Calder's studio was likened to an old French farmhouse or barn filled with metal, wire and mock-ups of his work. This sculpture, gifted to the guest, was a combination of a mobile and a stabile. The lower part was stable and the upper part was mobile. It was an amazingly balanced piece and the movement of the hand was extraordinary. The piece was noted for its craftsmanship and Calder's monogram. Such pieces are easy to fake, so it's important to have them authenticated by the Alexander Calder Foundation in a gallery setting with proper documentation. The sculptor's value could be around. In a gallery setting, this would be $250,000. Wow. Jeez, that's amazing. Presented before us is a delightful silver box. The guest purchased it from a colleague who needed funds. Well, I know very little about it, Alistair, other than the fact that I was in business and one of the people in my office came to me and said he was a bit short of cash. Upon closer inspection, a portrait of King Charles I is revealed at the top with his wife, Henrietta Maria's portrait, inscribed below. Intricate and beautiful figures adorn the box, giving it a mesmerizing, slightly sinister charm. What I particularly like about this box is these fantastic, fanciful... This piece is a gambling counter box containing a set of exquisite counters within. And I think if we take the lid off, we'll see inside these fantastic counters. Simon van der Pas, a master engraver, is associated with these remarkable pieces. He was a Dutch engraver and printmaker, active in England during the early 17th century. His death in 1647 suggests that this exceptional piece was created circa 1640, prior to his passing. Interestingly, the box contains 32 counters, just shy of its capacity. A truly unique situation. Every one of these counters is a work of art. The cumulative value of these outstanding pieces reaches an auction estimate of. Well, I can tell you it's more than two thousand pounds. It is. Yeah. It's now six to eight thousand pounds. No. Pottery expert David Lackey presented several examples of palissy ware. 
Palissy ware is a 19th century term for ceramics produced in the style of the famous French potter Bernard Palissy, who developed this style by casting actual animals and molding them in wet clay. These pieces were meant strictly for display and not intended as dinnerware. This particular piece was made by Emmanuel Mofra in the late 19th century, around the 1880s to 1890s, in the city of Colderstone. It was highlighted for its typical English frogs and snakes against a grassy background, indicative of Portuguese origin. Being particularly common, this piece was valued at. This particular piece is relatively common and would usually sell for around $1,000 to $1,500. Another French piece was from Tours, made by Land Naturaliste de Uteur between the 1860s and 1880s. Its detailed modeling made it more desirable and valuable, with a retail value of. It would have a retail value around three to four thousand dollars. This high price was because the marked pieces by this maker were particularly unusual and thus more valuable. Lastly, a beautiful charger, made in Paris by Barbazette between the 1850s and 1880s, was examined. Although unmarked, it was identified by its depth, dimension, and typical glazes. With a distinctive snake on the rim, this artistic piece was valued at around. And so the value? Around $15,000 at retail. The guest's mother owned a pin made for her by her husband, a Navy PT boat officer. And he was on a PT boat during the war. And my mom had this pin made. Now where the diamond came from, I have no idea. It features a diamond of unknown origin and a detailed mosquito. The guest's aunt believes the pin was crafted by Wilmington, Delaware jeweler Willard Davis. Mosquitoes are common in Victorian jewelry, but a mosquito on a torpedo is unique. The mosquito was a nickname for PT boats and the pin features two torpedoes. The pin's metal is white gold and the mosquito is incredibly lifelike. The guest's mother added the diamond to enhance the pin's appearance. The diamond is an old mine cut, weighing approximately one and a half carats. This type of jewelry is often called sweetheart jewelry and was traditionally given as a gift from gents to the ladies. The appraiser estimates the pin's auction value at. I would say at auction, you're looking at $2,000 to $3,000. Wow. This is pretty cool. Bakelite, made by Leo Bakeland in 1907. The cherry pin has vibrant, glossy red cherries. The cherries are attached to green bake-like leaves, adding realism and charm. This design captures the playful, colorful Art Deco style. These affordable luxuries symbolize elegance and fun during the Great Depression. Bakelite jewelry, like cherry pins, is prized for its unique look and history. The Bakelite cherry pin symbolizes vintage fashion and creativity. The appraiser valued its vibrant charm and historical significance for $400. This vase was selected by the guest when her great aunt passed away in 1964. Her mother thought the vase was ugly and easy to give up. She knew some details about the vase, including the date, 1905, and the double A mark. The vase was made by Van Briggle, who moved to Colorado Springs due to TB. Factory still operates today, though Van Briggle died in 1904. The vase is an example of challenging Matt Glaze work overseen by his wife, Anna. Anna ran the company until it was sold to businessmen in 1912. This is a challenging piece. It's painted with Matt Glazes, would have been overseen by his wife, Anna, who survived, of course, and ran the company till around 1912 when it was sold out to businessmen. There's a misconception that the company stopped making good pieces after Van Briggle's death. With its organic glazes, it is considered an academic piece and is valued at. Auction, I would estimate it at between $1,500 and $2,000, so certainly better than most. Okay. The updated value of the vase has decreased to $1,000 to $1,500. This painting belonged to the guest's mother, who passed away in 2001. She bought it from a gallery in Georgia, and the guest is unknown of its exact origin. The artist is James E. Buttersworth, a renowned marine painter from England. The painting is a yacht race with an American flag in the distance. Buttersworth was known for his detailed like small flags and retailed depictions of boats. The painting's perspective suggests Buttersworth was likely in a small boat race during the race. The appraiser believes the painting could be from America's Cup race. Similar paintings have sold at auction for around $90,000 each. The painting's estimated value is. So I think you could safely say at auction that this would be an estimate of eighty dollars to $120,000. <laughs> You're kidding. 
The updated value of this lovely painting is $50,000 to $70,000. Searchlights may not be the first thing that comes to mind when thinking of antiques, but they certainly have a unique charm. Ted revealed an antique searchlight, mentioning its military and possible naval origins, although it lacked visible markings to confirm this. The restoration plan involved rewiring, rust removal, and possibly lacquering or waxing to prevent further corrosion. The searchlight's unique glass, its most critical component, needed careful handling. Ted proposed creating a stand with a single metal rod and wheeled feet for mobility, aiming to maintain functionality while adding a touch of elegance. Siakam had paid £320 for the searchlight. You know, on the right stand, yeah. you know, 12 to 1500 Right, OK. So um, I'll leave that with you, and uh, I'll be back at lunchtime. <laughs> All right, mate. Take care, Good man. see you. Ted began disassembling the searchlight, emphasising the importance of preserving the glass. He noted the symmetrical design, with a parabolic front and back, contributing to its aesthetic appeal. After dismantling most of the searchlight, Ted examined the metal end where the old megawatt bulb was connected, yeah, it's a little bit worse than actually you first kind of appear. It turned out to be in worse condition than initially thought. He was particularly concerned about a part resembling an old telephone dial, which had cooling holes to prevent overheating. However, these holes had become rusted weak spots. Ted decided to give it a gentle tap with a hammer to assess the extent of the damage and decided to replace it with new sheet steel. I'm going to, do, I'm going to get a piece of sheet steel. We're going to... I'm going to mark it out and I'm going to put this dimple in it first. Once we've got the dimple in it, we can then get the holes cut. Meticulously marking and shaping the new piece, Ted avoided weak spots during fabrication. Using tools like a nibbler and a jenny wheel, he refined the metal and drilled 12 precise spaced holes. Once satisfied, he replaced the rusted part, ensuring a secure fit. Despite Siakam's request for a simple stand, Ted opted for a more elaborate design. Envisioning a conical base with a steel framework and a copper interface for visual contrast, this detailed work aimed to enhance the searchlight's appeal and marketability. When Siakam returned to inspect the restored searchlight, he was amazed by Ted's work, praising the quality and design of the fabricated stand. Wow, Ted. Siakam. My God, Ted. It's absolutely amazing. The guest's mother and father-in-law were furnishing a home about 40 years ago. They brought several paintings, including this wonderful piece at a flea market in the New York area. It is signed by Edward Mitchell Bannister, a 19th century first African-American award winner artist. This particular painting was done in 1879, and Bannister died in 1901. It was likely painted in Provenance, Rhode Island, where Bannister is most associated. His paintings, often of cattle, are evocative and typical of his style. He worked as a ship's cook, barber, and photographer while continuing to paint. After marrying a New York City businesswoman, he devoted more time to painting. He was inspired by the French Barbizon school. Despite minor damages, this painting is valued at. At auction, I would say $6,000 to $10,000. Yeah. 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 A fascinating item has emerged that captures the spirit of vintage fairgrounds, a phenomenal Frankenstein automation from the 1960s. This sideshow piece, completely scratch-built, is an example of rough yet charming craftsmanship from the era. It was once a thrill for fairgoers, designed to stand up and sit down, bringing the classic story of Frankenstein to life. This automation, potentially crafted by the ventriloquist doll maker Jim Tattersall, is sophisticated despite its basic ingredients. Tattersall specialized in electronic moving figures, and if this piece is indeed his work, it showcases his expertise. So, I mean, it was not a lot of money. It was under a thousand pounds as it stands. What I'd love to see is fully functioning. The goal is to restore its functionality, ideally having it fully operational with a plug and an on-off switch. The restoration is being undertaken by Michael and Maria in Forres, Scotland. They are working on reviving the monster's paper mache head, which has shown significant wear over nearly 60 years. Using traditional materials like wallpaper paste, salt, and special glue. Soak it really well in the glue. That makes it really nice and pliable. Maria meticulously rebuilds the head with layers of strong brown paper. 
Just start the long, slow process of building up the layers. Meanwhile, Michael rewires the mechanisms with servo motors to control the face's movements. Once the face is back in working order, restoring the body's movements is challenging. The monster's face is back to life, but there's still the tricky task of the scary body movements to come. Michael installed a new old stock motor to power the legs, adding a counterweight for balance and support. Maria mended the damaged head, restoring the shine to the eyes and teeth. Additionally, a new set of servos hardwired to a control box ensures that this 1960s sideshow star is ready to terrify once more. The final step is assembling the body parts and making them work harmoniously. The completed Frankenstein is then returned to Wales, where dealer Drew eagerly awaits its arrival. With the addition of sound effects, some smoke, and a dark atmosphere, it becomes a truly wonderful and chilling spectacle. Upon unveiling, Drew is thrilled and terrified by the automation's lifelike appearance and movements. That is horrible, isn't it? <laughs> it's meant to be, but oh my god. The automation, now valued between £8,000 and £10,000, stands as a testament to the enduring fascination with the Frankenstein story and the rich history of fairground attractions. Our guest found this miniature portrait at an antique shop in Brewster, Massachusetts in the early 1950s. Intrigued by its charm, the guest purchased it for about $150 to $175. The portrait is based on ivory and features a baby in a red dress with one bare foot. A unique detail is the baby's look attributed to sucking on a rock candy. And when it comes to portraits, the most desirable ones usually are of children. Mm -hmm. attractive children. It's nice to have them by a known artist. The appraiser highlighted the portraits of attractive children by known artists are highly desirable. The portrait dates between 1825 and 1850, with the case being 25 years newer. This leather case features mother of pearl and gilt embossing. The estimated retail value of this miniature portrait is at. All of us felt very comfortable that this would be worth retail twelve to fifteen thousand dollars. You are fooling me. On a quest for treasures old and fine, Drew's off to a hat factory, a gem to find. Drew is searching for unique items and loves exploring old factories and industrial buildings for their different processes, machinery, and furniture. This time, he drives all the way to Luton in Bedfordshire to visit Philip, who owns one of the oldest hat factories in the UK. Drew searches for stools, Benches, molds, mirrors, and stands, all clean for hat making. In the 1930s, Luton made 17 million hats a year, once Britain's hat making hub. The Wright family, hat makers since 1889, serves clients like Princess Anne and Vivian Westwood. Drew arrives and meets Philip, who offers a tour of the showroom, now used as a studio for retail clients. Drew tries on some of the hats and enjoys the experience. These pieces, likely from the 18th century with later modifications, include carvings with oriental designs and fish-shaped handles, possibly worth around £500. And in Stratford-upon-Avon, woodturner Phil Irons is making a bespoke gear knob to replace the mismatched aftermarket one. Drew thinks about making an offer for them, while also showing an interest in some old Singer workshop chairs. The Singer chairs, from the late 1950s, have cast iron bases and pine wood seats and backrests. Although they can't be used in the industry anymore, they're still comfortable and valuable. Philip has six chairs, and Drew sees them as perfect for a dining room. Philip offers them at £100 each, and Drew agrees to the deal. For the wooden pieces, Drew decides to offer £400 for all of them, and Philip accepts. The outside of the spider is also undergoing some changes. Our guest received these porcelain figures from her husband's grandmother's place when no one else wanted them. They were initially purchased by her husband's great-grandfather as a housewarming gift in the 1840s. These figures depict the four seasons, spring, summer, fall and winter. The appraiser noted the exceptional quality and detailed modelling of the figures, particularly the drapery and painted flowers. They are identified as German, made in the Meissen style, but not exact copies. On this other one, all the little flowers in the dress are painted, and we can see those in the front and the detailing here over on the cornucopia. 
the figures are estimated to date between 1850 and 1880, adding to their historical value. Despite a minor break on one wrist, the overall condition is almost perfect. The appraised retail value of the set ranges from. Our estimate is that these would have a retail value between $1,500 and $2,000. Wow. These vintage drawers are not just any ordinary piece of furniture. They represent a significant piece of craftsmanship and history. Robin and Shia Khan are captivated by the set of industrial drawers they've acquired, which originally came from a genuine workshop. Robin notes the craftsmanship, speculating that the piece, made of pine, might date back to the late Victorian era and possibly may have been built by the workmen themselves. Despite some woodworm damage and general wear, Robin sees potential in the drawers, noting the intricate details and dovetail joints. Shia Khan acknowledges the damage and missing drawers, but believes Robin can restore it. He asks Robin to preserve any old labels found during the restoration. Robin enthusiastically takes on the project, even though Shia Khan paid a few hundred pounds for it, hinting it might have been overpriced. However, Robin is committed to restoring it out of appreciation for the craftsmanship. Robin starts by cleaning the unit with methylated spirits and carefully removing the old labels to preserve them. He then focuses on making replacement drawers from pine matching the existing frame. Using tools like a marking gauge and dovetail marker, Robin meticulously cuts and assembles the dovetail joints. The drawers are glued together with PVA glue, ensuring a solid fit. The drawer box has gone really, really well. It's a little bit touch and go at times because the wood for the size of the drawer box was so thin, but actually a little bit of perseverance and just taking my time over it. To add value, Robin builds a plinth making the piece freestanding and more accessible. He cuts mitre joints at 45 degrees to create clean lines, giving the plinth a picture frame-like appearance. After assembly, the plinth fits perfectly, elevating the drawer unit and giving it more presence. For the final touch, Robin opts for an ebonized finish, mixing French polish, button polish, ebony stain and black pigment. I want to put a finish on it that just makes it a bit richer, makes it look really nice. And um, I've been playing around with a few different stains and I think I've got one that I'm happy with. This bold step aims to enhance the piece's richness without losing its wooden essence. Robin applies multiple coats to build up the finish. When Shia Khan returns, he's impressed by the transformation. Wow, Robin. That's some change, man. The ebonized look and brass handles have given the piece a new lease on life. Originally intended for a workshop, the restored drawers are now suitable for a living room or hallway. Texan cowboy culture has thrived for generations with spurs and essential gear. More than tools, spurs are style statements and vintage ones are Western heritage relics. Texas spurs come in two basic shapes, big heavy punchy spurs and lighter, more delicate spurs. One vintage pair was made by P.M. Kelly in El Paso, Texas, starting in 1903. Kelly spurs could sell for. If they came on the market in a sale, they would go for $1,000 or $1,500. Another delicate and decorative style was made by J.R. McChesney. Those center spurs were made by J.R. McChesney. McChesney spurs tended to be more light and delicate than a lot of other Texas spurs. Dating to the early 1920s, McChesney spurs could bring. They would probably bring 1,200 to 1,500 for the pair. A third, beefier pair of spurs was made by J.O. Bass in Tullia, Texas, using car axles. Bass spurs from the 1920s to 1940s were highly prized. They could be worth. Those spurs would bring 5,000 to 8,000 dollars a little on the lower end because they've been cleaned. The entire collection is valued between $7,200 and $11,000. Explore Clangothlan's Motor Museum, where vintage cars reveal a British dream. In the town of Clangothlan, there's a special place called the Clangothlan Motor Museum, nestled by the River Dee and run by Jeff Owen and his family. It houses over 60 rare cars, motorcycles, and motoring treasures from the 20th century. A highlight of the museum is its impressive collection of vehicles, including the beloved Alfa Romeo and meticulously restored TR4. Visitors are captivated by the Red Rocket, a 1950s pedal car ingeniously crafted from surplus car parts, including those from the Royal Air Force. 
The estimated value for the pedal car is £2,000. Complete with detailed precious provenance and still in working order, it could be worth around £2,000. Among its collection are vintage motor oil signs and advertisements, offering glimpses into a bygone era of British motoring. Notably, an aged steel sign for Wakefield motor oil adorned with royal symbols and the iconic Wakefield logo draws collectors' admiration despite its weathered appearance. The estimated price for it is £300. Jeff Owen, the museum's caretaker, delights in sharing his treasures with visitors. During Drew's visit, he couldn't resist purchasing a few items, including the impressive hand-painted Austin sign and the historic Wakefield motor oil sign. The estimated value for it is £400. It's as old as Drew hopes, and if the reason for its mysterious wording can be deciphered, it could be worth around £400. More than just a collection of old cars and signs, Jeff Owen's museum embodies his dedication to preserving Britain's motoring heritage. Guest's dad gave her this piece about 27 years ago. It's an original oil painting by the famous artist, Philip Lightford. This painting was made as a billboard to go on top of a building. It's an original oil work and the master for a billboard. Narragansett Beer, a Rhode Island institution, featured this billboard. This billboard was displayed on a local building in Provenance and is remembered by many. It likely dates back to the late 1940s. This piece is valued at. And I'd put a value on this piece of 800 to to $1,000. Wow. Right. That's Good. terrific. That's great. Yeah. An updated value of this painting is now an impressive $1,800 to $2,000. A rare 1977 Star Wars poster, worn out by time, is carefully restored to bring back its original beauty. Saxon went to London to meet Ashley Brown, a top paper conservator, to restore a very special and delicate item, a 1977 Star Wars movie poster. He greeted Ashley and explained how fragile the poster was, which is why it was kept in a strong container. It's very, very delicate, oh. which is why it's in this much stronger container. They unrolled the poster and admired it. Despite its torn and worn out condition, Ashley was confident she could restore it. The poster was made in the US. Ashley suggested lining it with Japanese paper for strength and cleaning the discoloration. Saxon, who bought it for half a grand, knew how important it was to preserve this piece, originally meant to be thrown away after the movie's run in theatres. Saxon then visited Matt Fox, a Star Wars collector with a large collection at the Time and Tide Museum in Great Yarmouth. Matt recognised the poster as a Star A version, painted by Tom Young and noted its rarity and value, estimating it could sell for £1,300 to £1,400 after restoration. Meanwhile, Ashley started the careful process of cleaning and lining the poster using special water, blotters, Japanese paper and a mixture of adhesives she carefully aligned and stabilised it. This stage was crucial to avoid any damage. When Saxon came back to see the restored poster, it looked much better, brighter, stronger and more vibrant. With 40 years of stains and grime removed, Saxon was thrilled with the result. Noting how the stars in the poster stood out more and it felt more solid, Ashley was also pleased with the challenging but rewarding project. Saxon, now confident in the poster's restored value, planned to price it high. Reflecting on the experience, Saxon felt the restored poster was magical, a relic from 1977 that had once excited moviegoers. Our guest's cousin inherited this celestial indicator, which was invented by their great-grandfather in Hartford. Connecticut. The guest had owned it for about 20 years and only recently opened it. This celestial indicator, used to demonstrate the solar system's workings, includes the original instruction sheet and packing case. It features the Sun at the center, followed by Mercury, Venus, Earth and other planets. Despite some damage to the paper gauze, the Moon still moves and would orbit the Earth if fully functional. The indicator is over 100 years old, made from lacquered brass on a painted cast iron base with it's constructed from lacquered brass on a painted cast iron base. Now, according to our little instruction sheet here... Victorian technology like this is highly collectible today. At auction, this piece could easily fetch a value of... I would not be surprised to see this sell for between three and $5,000. Oh, <laughs> I'm surprised. Watch Drew and the team revive a rare 19th century clockwork hen, turning a frizzled fowl into a prized gem again. 
Drew exchanges cheerful greetings with another person, setting an eager tone. They both express anticipation about what awaits them, creating a sense of excitement. As they speculate about their hidden surprise, one remarks, Lepoque, upon spotting a surprising sight, a hen or chicken that leaves them in awe. They reminisce humorously about the healthier-looking ex-battery farm hens from their past, noting the chicken's worn condition with a mix of humor and nostalgia. Drew seeks an explanation about the intriguing object, learning that it was made by Roulin de Combe around 1900. The item, rare and showing signs of its long existence, is a first for them both. Neither had seen or held such a piece before. Doing is rubbing. It's a very gentle form of sanding. Confirmations of its rarity adds to its allure, with Drew reassuring that it's extremely rare. The life-size strutting chicken's origin story unfolds, revealing that it was crafted by the renowned Parisian firm Roulin de Comp, famed for their ingenious mechanical engineering and superlative model making. This rare bird, dating from around the end of the 19th century, is highly collectible if operating correctly. However, there's much to do to restore this frizzled fowl to its former glory. The restoration process involves ensuring the chicken can walk with a realistic gait. Additionally, it focuses on making sure the chicken can lay eggs again. Drew entrusts the task to the experts. He promises to bring back a free-range, organic, happy, healthy chicken in return. The duo is thrilled to work on such a rare and exquisite piece, knowing that if they succeed, its value will be significantly enhanced. A sketch believed to be done by August Rodin for his sculptures was presented for appraisal. François-Auguste René Rodin was a French sculptor born in 1840 and generally considered the founder of modern sculpture. The famous sculptor was not only known for works like The Kiss and The Thinker, but also created many drawings. Most similar drawings were not actually by Rodin, so caution was necessary. This sketch had a reasonable chance of being authentic based on initial examination. The signature appeared very assured, with a fluid line and a mixture of graphite and watercolor. Verification by the Musée Rodin in Paris was essential, as they had a list of 8,000 verified drawings. The sketch's value was estimated at. I would estimate it for auction at probably $8,000 to $12,000. Drew and T uncovered treasures at Reloved in Norfolk's marshlands with Bino and Sarah Sullivan. Situated in Norfolk's marshlands, Downham Market is one of the oldest settlements. Few years, it's been home to Reloved, an antiques business created by husband and wife, Bino and Sarah Suleiman. Reloved has been operating for about five years. It started with small community auctions. Bino handles the buying while Sarah manages the selling. Formerly a fashion buyer, Bino uses his eye to find unique items across the country. One morning, Drew and T visit Reloved, meeting Bino and Sarah. They immediately spot intriguing pieces. Among these are century-old copper letters, likely from a shop or business frontage. Drew negotiates a deal and secures them while saying, I was going to say 500 a lot. Inside the former Red Cross building, Drew admires the eclectic assortment of antiques. He finds a Hadrill and Horseman floor-mounted lamp. It's remarkable for its original factory paint and complete condition. Could be worth around 800 pounds. He also discovers a brass table lamp with a conical enamel shade. The pair could be worth around £700. The shop is filled with fascinating items. Among them is a rare BSA neon sign. Good money for it already. What have you been offered? A thousand. A thousand? Yeah. Drew is impressed by the quality and uniqueness of Reloved's collection. About 15 to 20 years ago, the guest attended an antique show and discovered this piece that reminded them of jewelry their mother owned, featuring Brazilian butterfly wings. Recognizing the distinctive color and suspecting it might be a Tiffany, the guest purchased this scarab jewelry for approximately $400 at a local antique show. The appraiser explained that scarabs are beetles and were considered Egyptian deities symbolizing rebirth, regeneration, and life. Tiffany & Co. had created pieces featuring these beetles. The necklace that the guest brought was confirmed to be an authentic Tiffany piece. It was made of Favreau glass with an 18-karat gold chain dating to around 1915. The Tiffany & Co. mark on the bottom of the central pendant was verified as legitimate, much to the guest's amusement and delight. The appraiser valued this beautiful piece at... This piece 
would sell for eight thousand to ten thousand dollars. <laughs> Cars are not only for travelling, but also for fun and passion. Drew and Paul visit Roger Dudding, who invented ticket machines that help people queue. Later, Roger built a property empire. Roger's love for classic cars comes from his late father, who had a Clino during World War II. Drew and Paul are amazed by Roger's huge and varied car collection. They find it more impressive than many museums. Roger's collection is astonishing, with a wide array of rare and well-maintained cars. They focus on a Morris Minor Traveller. Drew appreciates its worn look and solid condition. There are some minor rust and wood issues, but despite this, the car is in good shape. Drew wants to make the car unique with a faux wicker effect. It's really, all the wing edges are brilliant. He hopes that this will make it stand out in a crowded market. After a pleasant test drive, they discuss the costs. They negotiate and agree on a price of £5,750. Drew plans to make small changes to the car. He wants it to appeal to more buyers without spending too much money. Very time consuming and very expensive. And then we've gone from a car that probably 500 people want to buy. This strategy aims to make a profit while preserving the car's charm. This fork is from the Hindenburg, the night it exploded at Lakehurst, New Jersey. The guest's parents were stationed there. His father was a Coast Guard engineer and went to see the Zeppelin. The explosion occurred on May 6th, 1937, and 97 people were on board, 36 of them died. It is unique with the LZ symbol, representing the Luft Zeppelin. Bits of metal adhered to the fork as it fell. Other Hindenburg artifacts, like pieces of the canopy, sometimes appeared at auctions. If auctioned, this fork could sell for. If it came up to auction, it would sell in the range of eight to $10,000. That's what I had hoped, and thank you for confirming it. Over time, the value of this fork dwindled to a range of $5,000 to $7,000. Drew Pritchard visits Shuckborough Hall, uncovering its rich history and treasures of craftsmanship. Shuckborough Hall is an ancient estate in Warwickshire and Northamptonshire. Shuckborough Hall is home to a variety of wildlife, including deer. The estate has been owned by the Shuckborough family since the 11th century. Historical records from the Domesday Book of 1086 highlight its long-standing history. During his visit to Shuckborough Hall, Drew explores its historical background. He discovers the current maintenance challenges overseen by Sir James Shuckborough. His notable find is a rare OK rake table. The piece exemplifies the craftsmanship of the table, early 20th century in the English uh, arts and crafts manner. The tables are renowned for their unique Y-shaped base. Collectors highly value them, owing to their historical and artistic significance. Drew's skillful negotiation secures the table. This highlights his expertise in artifacts and his commitment to preserving historic estates like Shuckborough Hall. His visit underscores the challenges and rewards associated with maintaining such culturally significant properties. Our guest inherited the quilt from their mother, who received it during her second marriage in the 1940s. The quilt, referred to as the Centennial Quilt, originally came with a paper listing the names of the people who made it in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. But that paper is now lost. The appraiser identified it as being in the style of a Baltimore album quilt, though not as finely made as professional Baltimore quilts. Differences in quilting ability are evident in the varied quality of the blocks, some being simpler while others are more detailed. The use of different materials in the squares, such as a very white block next to a more muslin-like block. We can tell because of the differences in the quality and the ability of the quilters, it's made by a number of different people. Right. Based on the red, green and white color scheme, the quilt likely dates from 1850 to 1860. It's possible that it could be a centennial quilt, but just looking at the quilt based primarily on the color scheme, mm -hmm all these red, green, and white squares. It actually looks like it's probably from 1850, as late possibly as 1860. The quilt has been washed at least once, giving it a puckered look, which slightly reduces its value. Although the quilt market has declined since its peak in the 1980s, the current insurance or retail value of this quilt is estimated to be at. Does this quilt for insurance value or the retail value would be somewhere between eight and ten thousand wow. dollars. 
in the height of the market, it would have probably been 12 to 15. Beds make our dreams come to life, offering a space where imagination and rest intertwine. Drew Pritchard, a salvage expert, visits Neville Griffiths' antiques in Lower Weedon. I would bet you the same amount of money you won't find another, find another one. one. This place is like a treasure trove of rare finds. Drew is interested in a unique Art Nouveau bed. He starts by offering £350, but Neville thinks it's too low. After some negotiation, they agree on £425, which Drew feels is a fair price. Next, Drew looks at a vintage opaline pendant light. Neville initially asks for a high price, but they settle on £40, a standard trade price. The big find of the day is a large wrought iron rose arch from around 1820. Do that lot first and then we've got a space to do then. It could be worth £4,500 if complete. Neville offers all the pieces for £1,500 and Drew buys it, knowing it's rare and valuable. The arches are big and will need careful handling. Drew's team will have to deal with removing them from the overgrowth. Despite the hard work, Drew is thrilled with the finds. There's not the 17 arches. The day combines tough deals with exciting discoveries. Overall, Drew finds his skill in finding and buying valuable items. Guests brought in these items that have been in the family for at least four generations. At least four generations now that belong to, I think, my great, great grandfather. He was in the Spanish-American War, and I think he lied about his age. I think he was 15 and he enlisted, and he was in Cuba. This is an artillery sword, scabbard and belt, made in 1843. The sword features an inscription of the production date and an initial JCB. And it was made in 1843. The initials that are beside the 1843 production date are JCB. On the back side of the blade, we have the mark of Nathan P. Ames. He founded the Ames Manufacturing Company, one of the premier sword makers during the 1800s. We have the mark of Nathan P. Ames. It's marked N.P. Ames, Springfield, meaning Springfield, Massachusetts. Sure. And they were one of the premier sword makers during the 1800s. Another thing to note about this sword is that it's a short artillery saber, and this style was manufactured until the 1860s. This beautiful sword has a nice age on it and a beautifully cast brass handle. It comes alongside the scabbard and the belt. The scabbard is a completely different type of leather, a black leather that's been tanned, than the belt ring. The belt ring is an oil-treated leather, also called buff leather. Most of the time when it dries out, it'll break very easily, just like that. And this one, spectacular. Yeah. Although the belt has some damage, it is still beautiful and pliable as a collection in today's market. These war items will have an estimated value of. The scabbard and the belt would bring between 3,000 and 3,500. Wow, that's amazing. You need an eye to see the hidden treasures in Thriftville. Drew and T travel 200 miles to Thriftville in Lincolnshire. Their purpose is to meet Alan Thompson, who is both a demolition trader and a collector of various items. Alan and Joseph have a remarkable collection of salvage. They are continuing a tradition that was started by Alan's grandfather. Upon arrival, Drew and T are welcomed by Alan and Joseph. Drew is impressed by their large collection. This collection has been built over many years, starting with Alan's father. The collection now has... Nearly 70 now. Seven! Drew notices a Land Rover and feels tempted to buy it for... About 4,000. About 4,000. However, he decides against it because he prefers an 80-inch model. He and T continue exploring the yard, finding various items from demolition jobs. These XMOD bulkhead lights came from a local RAF camp. Drew negotiates a fair price for the lights for about... They were 70 quid. Yeah. Drew explores deeper into the yard and finds a roof fen with a unique North African style. It came from Charrington's Brewery in London. Although the vent is damaged, its ornate design and patina make it worth around. How much for this then, Alan? Uh, three and a half. The visit ends with Drew and T thanking Alan and Joseph for letting them see their amazing collection. We are presented with a tavern table. This is a tavern table. It was made in about 1750. The guest inherited this item from her mother, although it originally belonged to her aunt. The table was made in 1750 and is from Virginia. To come across a Virginian table is rare because southern furniture is not very common. 
It's what we'd call a Queen Anne figured walnut one drawer tavern table. I'd probably say 1740 to 60. This table features a simple baluster turning, which is a double baluster with unique details. When we think of Southern furniture, there's not a whole lot of it, and we tend to call it neat and plain. Southerners kind of look to England. Looking further, we see the drawer, which features very stripy wood, likely yellow pine. Very stripy wood, and this is yellow pine. Okay. And that's what you want to see on a Virginia table. The primary wood of this table is walnut, which is typical for southern furniture. If we look at the condition, we see an old grungy surface with some rings and burn marks. These rings, yep. these burn marks, you've got some water stains. It's like nobody ever touched it. It's a yep. time capsule. On the front side, the legs have great color with a wooden pin that stands out. I love this. This is a wooden pin that's just beaming right out, popping out because of expansion and contraction. In today's market, this old one-drawer walnut tavern table with unique turnings and significant wear would cost about. I would estimate it, and I think it's conservatively, at $10,000 to $15,000. You were my best friend. Well, I'm glad I could be. Dogs are not just our pets. They're also part of our family. Enzo is recognized everywhere he goes. When Drew leaves him in the car with the window down, people often stop to talk to him. When people see Drew on the street, they say hi and ask where's Enzo. Enzo has handled his fame well. He's a bit proud now, but still happy with a biscuit. There was one funny moment that didn't make it into the new series. During a final load up in the van, T fell out of the back. He landed right in a hedge with his legs sticking up in the air. It was caught on camera, but it won't be shown. People always seem more interested in Enzo than Drew which makes Drew laugh. Enzo enjoys the attention. And he ended up with his legs sticking up in the air like that. He's become a little celebrity. As long as he still has his treats though, he's content. The guests' dad and Uncle Henry were in the scrap iron business in the early 50s. They acquired some cast iron from street hobos in Baltimore. Well, my dad and my Uncle Henry were in the scrap iron business back in the early 50s. And um, they acquired it from some street hobos. This item is a cast iron gateway. Most gateways from that era were shaped like cannonballs. They were commonly used in England in the 18th century and America until the mid 19th century. The wear on the beak suggests frequent use. Original multicolor paint decoration is still visible. This piece is both functional and decorative, a fine example of American folk art. Its estimated auction value is. Um, I'd say conservatively, its auction estimate would be six to eight hundred dollars. No, oh, great. <laughs> Gates are not only for protection, but also for adding character and charm to a property. Drew greets Nev and shows him a late 19th century wrought iron gate from Northern Ireland. Despite its worn condition and missing parts, Drew sees potential in the gate's simple design. Nev stokes the forge to welding heat. He welds two pieces of iron together. He asks Nev to convert the gate to eyelets and add a shepherd's crook design. Nev plans to keep the gate's surface paint, even if it reveals a green layer underneath. The gate's initial value is £400, but Nev's work could increase it. Nev starts by replacing the missing finial, ensuring it matches the original style. He uses traditional blacksmithing techniques, just like those from 150 years ago. Nev then forges new hinges and rivets to secure the gate's loose bars. Using his favorite tool, a bic iron, he shapes the metal with precision. Nev decides to create a creature's head instead of the suggested shepherd's crook. He aims for a mythical, ferocious look, starting with the creature's tongue. So the two halves now are going to go together. Nev hopes Drew will like the unique addition. A few days later, Nev shows the restored gate to Drew at his warehouse. Drew is amazed by the transformation, noting the gate's authentic look. Nevis fixed the broken bars, replaced a fleur-de-lis, and changed the hanging mechanism. The highlight is the Welsh dragon, which blends perfectly with the gate. Old looking, mythical. This isn't what Drew's going to be expecting. Drew praises Nev's work, saying the gate could now sell for 3,000 to 3,400 pounds. The gate's new width makes it useful for modern needs, like fitting a drive-on mower. 
Drew emphasizes the gate's rarity and easy saleability. Nev's use of traditional methods ensures the gate's authenticity. Both Drew and Nev are proud of the final result. In a lively appraisal session, an enthusiastic guest shares her deep fondness for Art Nouveau jewelry, particularly a cherished pin gifted upon her daughter's birth. Expertly evaluated, the pin bears French Art Nouveau hallmarks, notably the distinctive eagle head, indicating 18 karat gold. The appraiser identifies the piece as crafted by Lucien Hertz, a pivotal figure in French jewelry known for exquisite enamel work and intricate designs. Hertz, born in 1864, gained renown through his association with renowned jewelers like Felice and Boucheron, receiving accolades such as the gold medal at the 1900 Paris International Exhibition. The pin, adorned with portraits of women and delicate floral carvings, exemplifies Hertz's versatility and mastery, echoing a piece housed in the Mousse d'Orsay. Estimates place the pin's value at $20,000 to $30,000 retail owing to its historical significance and craftsmanship. I place a retail value on this piece of between thirty dollars and $40,000. Wow. <laughs> I was not expecting that. I, I thought it would be, you know, maybe...